knowledge by itself is not power. It holds the potential for power if we use it as a guide for action. Edward D. Griffin. Beware the head of the snake. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for entering the tiger's den. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for spending your time in the tiger's den. We will try not to waste it. I am an Angry Tiger, and it is Wednesday, February 1st, 2023 AD. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest, and we are going to travel the realms of anarchy. Hold on to your hats. You've got the tiger by the tail. With us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, novelist and scriptwriter, lecturer in economics, philosophy and ethics. It is said that his bones are actually made of pieces of the Liberty Bell, a supernova of dynamic thought and free thinking, a comet blazing a trail of liberty through the universe with his extensive understanding of liberty and freedom, the bane of authoritarians across the galaxy, ladies and gentlemen, prepare to be supercharged by the energy of Guard Goldsmith. <laughs> Guard, welcome, man. How you doing this evening, brother? I'm doing great, man. Thanks so much. This is That's fantastic. Sweet. What an intro, dude. That was fantastic, Tiger. Thank you for welcoming me and really putting on such a wonderful show. It looks fantastic. It sounds great. You look awesome. And thank you for your generosity. Really appreciate it, man. Well, no, thanks, Guard. It's an honor to have you here, man. I mean, you're, you know, I'll, I'll try my best to uh, fulfill, uh, fulfill that big brain of yours with some intelligent conversation, you know. <laughs> but um you know tonight is uh something i've been wanting to talk about talk to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about for a long time since i was 12 years old now slipping through the anarchist cookbook right yeah and i see this quote you know I, I can't remember the whole quote but he said hang me for it it was about being free and stuff and there's a lot of marxist stuff in there i understand that that right. that whole thing is kind of weird but right. I, you know i wanted to discuss anarchy and i wanted to discuss christian anarchy and because i don't think People know what that means. When I first heard you say that, I'm going to be honest with you. I fell out of my chair a couple of years ago when I heard you use that term. I'm like, what is that? You know, yeah. that, that sounds crazy. Right. But uh, after being a libertarian and then after hearing some of your views, it clicked. It made sense. Oh, great, man. Great. Well, it's uh, I feel like I'm with a good kindred spirit anyway. Uh, you know, you're just uh, you're always so, so kind to me, man. And and. You know, it's just great to be on the show. Uh, it's such a great, great show. Uh, and, of course, you know, Knights of the Storm is a new phenomenon. And you are one of the driving factors behind this thing. And being able to, you know, hear you say that, you know, you've been interested in these these sorts of ideas for so long. Same thing as, as for me. And, you know, we, we're just growing up in different parts of the world. But uh, here we are together, man. We got we got brought together thank god so yeah it's crazy it. isn't it the way that, yeah. that things work you know i mean yeah. it's and that's the thing about all this is people don't understand there's so many different terminologies and like i always like to say word, words are super important right yeah so when, when people think of anarchy you know they, they think of this kind of stuff hundreds yeah. of anarchists arrested after athens protests descend into violence and they said pictures of this guy right yeah and they you know what is anarchy i see pictures like this you know yeah. Headlines like that. Look, look, pictures of this guy. Another guy. scary stuff, right? I mean, you yeah. look at this. Look, look at this. You look at this stuff, and and that's what that's what everybody has the idea in their head of what anarchy is, because that's what they're being told by everybody. Right. What, what do you think about that, man? Well, yeah, yeah. The, the two major thoughts come into my head that uh, you know, perennially, uh, repeatedly, uh, and perennially, um, it it is. Uh, a real disservice to anybody who wants some real information when so-called journalists are unfair or ignorant or both. And uh, they use the term anarchy to be synonymous with chaos, um, which it is not. Uh, anarchy just means no rulers. It doesn't mean no rules. It means no polis. It doesn't mean no governance. You can have governance without the government. Right. Right. And uh, and and it's the most peaceful way to go about it. Everybody in their daily routine actually engages in anarchist situations, just having a conversation with someone, just going to a store and getting a muffin or whatever, a piece of gum. That's an anarchist relationship. You're not 
checking with some great approval for some great approval from some government entity beforehand to see if you can engage in it. Now, that might be lurking in the background, you know, but that inherently we know we would do this anyway, even if the government weren't involved. And so when we talk about anarchy, it doesn't mean chaos. It means no rulers on earth, no human rulers uh -huh. engaging in aggressive violence against others. And it, it incorporates the non-aggression principle. You know, uh, you don't initiate aggressive force and violence against another person. And that includes things like defrauding people in addition to physical violence and things like that. You know, um, that that libertarian understanding that was put into my brain so many years ago, non-force, coercion is force. Yeah. Um, that really brought this kind of home for me when I started looking into this. You know, um, it, yeah. it really did. The state, you know, and, and that's my argument for everyone. The state by default, at its birth, it uses force to impose its will upon the populace that's just that's how it works you know yeah. Yeah. and you know for you know i mean you know this okay and i like to keep things you know uh you know some people don't know exactly what anarchy means and this this is the I, I, this is a great art this uh britannica encyclopedia yeah. online have you ever seen this this is a great no i haven't seen it anarchy. no yeah it I'm is looking, extreme, this is, yeah. it's extremely in depth but this is the basic you know, understanding anarchism, anarchism is a cluster of doctrines and attitudes centered on the belief that government is both harmful and unnecessary. Anarchist thought developed in the West and spread throughout the world, principally in the 20th century. Now, I, I, I tend to argue with this a little bit because I did read some stuff where it actually started in 800 BC, goes all the way back to 800 BC in China and in ancient Rome and in ancient Greece, right? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. And there are so many great figures who have been involved with it. Uh, whether you look at uh, Lao Tzu with uh, Taoist philosophy, uh, yep. whether you look at uh, some of the uh, the people who sort of preceded or uh, were contemporaries of people like Aristotle, um, who never really got the recognition that they should have gotten. Right. Um, yeah, uh, there are a lot of a lot of different philosophers who who had those sorts of ideas. And I ran across um, Aristotle's name several times when I was doing this research. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Der it's derived from the Greek root anarchos, meaning without authority. Anarchism, anarchist, and anarchy are used to express both approval and disapproval. In early usage, all these terms were pejorative. For the example, dur see now here is here here it comes, ladies and gentlemen. This is where. The rulers through the ages always use words and they use things as propaganda. So back in the English Civil Wars, you know, back in 1642, the radicals, the levelers who called universal manhood suffrage were referred to their opponents as Switzerlands anarchists. And during the French Revolution and leader of the moderate Grenadin factor fraction of parliament, Jacques Pierre Brissot, accused his most extreme rivals, the Ingras, I'm not probably not saying that right, of being advocates of anarchy. So, and I highlighted that stuff because I wanted to point out, you know, the basic meaning so everybody understands it. But look what they do. Look, who are the anarchists today? Who would they be? People who stand up for free speech, everybody. I mean, that whole, all the January 6th people, look how they used that term to smear them. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's... Yeah. That's just something that I had noticed that it was really kind of, you know, interesting. What, what do you think about that? Are them using it? Yeah. You know, in, in studying the, the history of uh, peace loving anti-statists, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, figures like um, Jesus Christ. And, and, and I will bring this up, too, you know. If people look in the Bible, um, I had uh, uh, one of my students brought up Romans and uh, she said, you know, in Romans. They Jesus is asked at the entrance whether he should pay his taxes. And uh, Jesus says, you know, you know, I'm paraphrasing. Jesus says, let me see the coin whose face is on that coin. And he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Render unto God what is God's, right? Now, the, and the, you take different versions of the Bible, it has different different ways that that is said. 
but as far as a Christian anarchist point of view goes, it's no different than any other anarchist point of view, which is that there should be no man engaging in threats of violence or coercion against someone else. You have a right to be left alone by me. I have a right to be left alone by you. The state automatically, by definition, infringes on that right because it won't leave you alone, even as it tells you that it's not leaving you alone in order for it to provide your protection against other people. Well, right. all the government is, is other people, really. So it's just a bunch of people telling you, cough up money for your own protection or we're going to hurt you. That's what it is. That's all it is. It's a protection racket with a bunch of artifices, uh, artifices attached to it. And the way they have, apply these labels. So uh, one of the interesting things is, and to go into the Christian anarchy aspect of it, I said to the student, I said, yeah, but you got to remember, what had Christ been telling people all that time? If he says, render whose face is on this, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. First, we know that they were doing everything they could to arrest him. They wanted to trip him up so they could arrest him. They wanted him to say something revolutionary. Don't pay your taxes. But he didn't say that exactly. He, he, uh, he um, relied on the smarts of the people listening to him and what he had already taught them that nothing belongs to man. We all belong to God. God created all of us. The coin belongs to God. We belong to God. Everything belongs to God. Everything exists because of God. We are right. a manifestation of God's right. will. Right? right. So when he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, he's telling them, what have I told you before? Nothing is Caesar's. Caesar belongs to God. The coin belongs to God. So what he's really saying is, much like Robin Hood was not a thief from other people, he was a tax protester, and his, his uh, reputation has been sullied by people who constantly say, oh yeah, they're playing Robin Hood against the rich. No, Robin Hood didn't steal from the rich and give to the poor. Robin Hood took back stuff that was taken by the government. It was taken from the people. That's Robin Hood was a violent tax protester. Christ's image in that and Christ's statement in that, I think, is often misunderstood. Because if we look at the Ten Commandments, thievery and lusting after other people's belongings, those are sins. Right. In the right. Ten Commandments. So if you have not been given permission to take something from the person who owns it, inherent in the Ten Commandments is the recognition of private property. Yeah. Of self-ownership and of ownership of property. Yeah. Right. So if we recognize that, then we can't infringe on another person and we can't infringe on what the other person owns because the Bible says we can't, right? Well, yeah, and the Ten Commandments are clear. They're not up for interpretation like a gospel. It, yeah. it, it's a simple statement. It is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. Exactly, exactly. Now, and that's from the Christian standpoint. And then logically, you can also interpret it this way, which I often mention to people. When I open up my classes, I say, okay, I show them the simple machines. And I say, okay, somebody, you know, anybody want to come up to the board and draw me one of the simple machines? And they're like, uh, and I was like, all right, let's go back to the Greeks. Let's go back to Archimedes. Uh, let's go back to, you know, the early, early mathematicians and so on. They didn't create these things. They just mentioned many of the early simple machines. So you got the lever, one of the earliest ones. The, the, mo the most basic was, was the inclined plane, most likely. But the lever was probably used by people. And as I mentioned, what you get there is we start to run through how economics and morality and ethics are actually the same thing because you own yourself and right. you have to value what you want and you have to be able to freely work with people. Once you can freely work with people and you can still retain the fruits of your labor as the Bible dictates, as the Ten Commandments says, as we know that coin doesn't belong to anybody but God and God dictates that nobody should steal that from you, right? Nice. So yeah. there's the inherent concept that taxation is stealing just voted on by a group of people or by some emperor or whatever it's another person saying i am going to impose my will on you in a violent manner if you don't if you don't concede i will hurt you um but right. anyway to get back to the the inclined plane thing what ends up happening is you tell students you say okay so this is a this is a tool the inclined plane uh by increasing distance 
we decrease the amount of effort per, per unit of distance, we just increase the number of units of distance, and we can have, have one person do the work that normally free, previously required two people to lift something directly up, right? So now we freed one guy and he can go do something else. That leads to, uh, as we know, that leads to the ability of that guy to do more. Then we also have the non-physical machines. Division of labor is one of those non-physical machines. So when people, as I, and I mentioned you know, to the students, and I probably mentioned it to you maybe on the air, off the air, but for those people maybe just joining or whatever for the first time, um, you know, it wasn't settled agriculture that brought about division of labor. You know, that's a misnomer that teachers tell students, and I don't even think they think about it. They just think that that's the way it is. They saw the sketch in some textbook, and they're like, oh, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, that, you know, they had to, no, no. If you're, if you're wandering nomads, and you have kids and pregnant women and old people with you, they're not going on the hunt. You have division of labor right there. Individuals being individuals mean you already have division of labor. We're not one gelatinous mass. We already, exactly. Yeah. And, and people that, are going to be assigned yeah. to what they do best. Yeah. They're not assigned. People are going to do what they do best. Exactly. Other people are going to recognize it and let them do what they do best, right? right. John's right. a good trapper. Um, Chuck's a good, you know, spear thrower, you know, so that kind of thing, it just works itself out yeah. and it works itself out naturally. Right. right? And There's if it no doesn't force. work, it's so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it doesn't work itself out, your tribe's not going to survive very long. They're going to no. go, you know, no. and, and, and back to the Romans 13 thing real quick, you know, when, when, and everybody has their different interpretations of it. The way I took that is <laughs> Jesus is looking at this coin, right? And basically, when he says, you know, render unto Caesar, what is, you know, unto Caesar, unto the Lord, what is the Lord's? He's basically saying this coin is nonsense. Yeah. It's nonsense. You know, mm -hmm. and he, like you said, he had, he couldn't just, oh, don't pay your taxes. This is nonsense. And say, hey, you know, this, this earth is nonsense and you should pay more tribute to the Lord and follow the Lord's law. Right. You know, yeah. and that. I, I think that 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 is that is definitely a way people can look at it. Don't put put so much significance into the money. Right. Exactly. Um, but by the same token, I think there's there's a there's a, a concept of of property there, um, which is that um, we are the property of God. You know, we yeah. were created by God. So the idea that, that goes back into the, the Old Testament is that there is an idea of property and no man should be stealing from someone else. And it doesn't matter if it's one man or 500 men, one man is an emperor or a so-called democracy voting that, well, we've got a better idea for your money than you do, right? Right. So I think it sort of carries carries that theme, in my opinion. But I understand how some people get to that that uh, concept, that sentiment. Um, but um, the, the thing that I think is really important is... Um, when you look at things like division of labor and, uh, and and so on and so forth, you recognize that that's a non-physical machine. If you don't want to have God involved with this, then you can look at rights as non-physical machines. Rights is a non-physical machine. It's something like language. It's something like mathematics. It's something like money. It's something like division of labor. It's something like trade that developed organically, if you want to look at it that way, because it facilitated people's lives to be bettered. Right. And if, it, if, it, if, if division of labor didn't work for people, they wouldn't have kept going. If, um, if trade didn't work for people, it wouldn't have kept going. And inherent in the concept of trade is the recognition that somebody actually owns something else to trade, right? And somebody else actually wants it. Right, and that you just Very can't simple. take it from them. Exactly. Right. And so it's that's right, and peace and peace and no rulers are inherently intertwined with that. They're inescapably, philosophically, and logically locked in together. Because when someone claims or a group of people claim that they rule over someone, they're forming a polis, that's just aggression. And that exactly. destroys all the other principles that we just mentioned. Everything goes out the window. Yep, so, exactly. You know, I, you know, I, I heard of, uh, the you might know the Italian anarchist, he was a poet, Pietro Gori. Yeah. And he defined the foundations of anarchy as the creation of new. And this is all the guards point. This is why I have this stuff pulled up, ladies and gentlemen, is the creation of a new fully liberated society through the application of, listen to this, moral, moral principles of mutual aid and social solidarity. That's the individuals agreeing with 
other people and themselves that this is how things are done to have our society here so we can all function. The division of labor fits into it. And we actually have a working society without someone telling us what to do. Yeah. The, yeah. It, it goes on to say the freedom of each is not possible without the freedom of all. This is very important. That, that, that statement right there is huge. And as, as the health of every cell cannot be without the health of the whole body, just like, you know, David Knight says this a lot. You can't have uh, public health if exactly. you don't have individual health. Exactly. That's just where I was going to go. I say that all the time, uh, like probably once a, once every couple months in an MRC TV video when I've been reporting on this Calabunga lockdown nonsense, I keep telling people, uh, you know, someone will bring up the term public health. And I said, there is no such thing as public health. That's a consequentialist, utilitarian, ends justifies the means, groupthink mentality that destroys the individual because it means that the individual can be sacrificed for the greater good, so called, of the group. But what right. people, yeah, and what people don't discuss is that group is just a word that's applied to any number of people, right? And in this case, they're trying to make it that the government can use this term to apply to certain groups. But what it really does is it means that one person can be sacrificed for that public group. And what it does is it recursively and in a way inverses, uh, reverses the concept of safety because it means every individual in that group can then be a target for the greater good, which actually destroys the goodness for the greater good. It puts exactly. everyone at risk. Yeah. And the thing about the government is that once it's done picking one person off, all the others are still targets for the future. So it, it, it undermines things even further. And there's no legitimacy in telling other people. And this is one of the things that that I think is, is, is sort of important to bring up is they talk about legitimate rulers. There's lo no legitimacy in telling someone you are now included in our group. Right. Where did that come from? And that's that's one of the things I brought up the other day on my on my program. Um, I was thinking on Sunday about just the very um, preamble of the Constitution itself, where they say we the people. What do you mean we? You see, when it's in within the political sphere, we is the most dangerous word of, inc of forced inclusion you could ever have. Because they weren't we the people. They were we the signers of the Constitution not we the people of the United States, right? Yeah, there's no contract between, you know, John Q. Public. Exactly. It was the founders who signed that document. Yeah, right? yeah. And that gets us into some of the later days uh, after antiquity when we get into the Middle Ages and then we get further into people like John Locke who are talking about, supposedly talking about natural rights, but they're really promoting this idea of the social contract. And again, there you've got the wordplay. You can have real contracts with individual will and you need you you let's look at it this way let's let's go back a little bit let's say hypothetically people say that the government reflects morality right well how can you have individuals individuals can't reflect their own morals if they don't are if they aren't allowed their free will right so you can't Come to God if a ruler is telling you how you're supposed to live and think. Look at that woman. She was praying silently on the street in England a little while ago, and she got arrested. She was praying in front of, I was going to mention that on my show tonight. Sometimes things come to your, your head. Like I found a story I wanted to talk about like two minutes after I finished the show. It was about the, the corruption in Ukraine. But um, what what I think is really interesting is unless you are, unless you are capable of expressing your free will of exercising your free will you can't come to god right and if you've got a ruler threatening you and coercing you and telling you i am the one who dictates morality not you or you've got a majority saying well you are included in this but it's really morality by public vote by popularity then that's not morality either you got to have, have individual will. And this is the problem with the so-called social contract. Just like you can't have individual will unless you don't have rulers threatening you, uh, in a way, you, you still can. You're just going to be killed and you have to be ready to be killed. You know, in the end, even when they're going to shoot you, when they tell you you have to bow down in front of the ruler, you still have free will. You say no. Right. And they'll kill you. You know, that's the way it is. You right. know, um, I mean, look what happened to the apostles. 
you know, um, it, it's it's and so many of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence, right? Um, Nathan Hale, you know, um, so many of these people gave up their lives for what they thought were the the important principles and natural natural law and logos. But what I think is interesting is when you look at a uh, the idea of morality and free will, um, you know, they they say that the, the cipher to this is somehow this magic social contract. Society is one thing that's made up of our free will, our individual choices and things like that. The polis is imposed on us. That's right. not society. So when they use the term social contract to apply to government imposition, it's an incredible effrontery to the language. But they do it all the time. It's it's of really it's, it's devilish. It's satanic, really. You know, well, no. Yeah, they twist the language. And, and this is a thing, Guard. A lot of people don't understand that they're twisting the language. They don't understand the big importance of words and they take advantage of this. And like, that's why that's where I believe it is satanic. It's evil, right? Yeah. That's a, yeah, you're yeah. taking advantage of somebody. You're conning somebody. You're, you're cheating somebody and telling them something and you're not telling them what it really is. You're using words to obfuscate your meaning. Yeah. Right. And that, right. That's what really, you know what? I'll tell you what guard, you are tearing it up here and we need to give you a big old roar. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I love it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's so cool. That's pretty sweet. So, you know, another thing I noticed in doing, you know, some of the research for this, and I kind of knew this, I mean, but a lot of people might not. So anarchy really crosses over and into a lot of political schools of thought, right? Dang, this is kind of small, but uh, I'll, I'll just belt it out for you here. I mean, it, it goes into sociology or socialism, excuse me, communism, mm -hmm. collectivism, and and uh, syndicalism, whatever that might be. I don't even know what that is. Uh, what is that, Guard? Syndicalism. Uh, syndicalism, um, uh, you remember in Monty Python and the Holy Grail where King Arthur's walking along and they're, they're passing by Michael Palin, who's the peasant in the mud. Yeah. And he's like, I'm your king. He goes, I didn't vote for you. And then he, and he goes, Ah, piss off! We're a, we're an anarcho an anarcho whatever syndical uh, a syndicate. The syndicalism is just uh, you know broken up uh, groups. Uh, okay, kind of uh, like kind of like Japan in the feudal era with all the different emperors and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's just broken up broken up syndicates, and there's some question as to whether or not those are voluntary or involuntary see the well, problem this is the, thing. this is the thing i'll tell you what after reading yeah. this chart I'll, I'll say it you know yeah, so yeah. then it goes into individualism down here is the anarchy right, right. then it goes it, it goes into the green it goes into religious it goes into the republican party it goes into the democrat party it's all over the place right but you know here's the thing again they hijack it i i, I okay so there's 12 different time, types of anarchy you have Marxist anarchists, you have communist anarchists, you have green anarchists, you have, they're taking something simple. How do you take something and dilute the meaning so much that you can take something that means, I mean, let's just dumb it down. No authority, no yeah. government and turn it into something communism, which yeah. is total control. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. You know, there was a professor at Boston university when I was there uh, she claimed she was a social anarchist, socialist anarchist. And I was like, look, you can be a social anarchist. That's what anarchy is. It's society. That's what it is. It's voluntary interaction. It's voluntary agreements, and voluntary association. It's no force. And you can form your own voluntary syndic syndicates and put them together. Vol voluntary collectives. That's what businesses are. Right. That's what a business is, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's what your poker meeting is. That's when you go to play a, 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 a pickup basketball game. That's anarchy right there. That's an anarchist collective right there. And for as long as you go, you got your rules and you're playing by your rules. You play whatever, right? That is anarchy. But it's different when it's anarchist socialist because a socialist implies the state and they the two shall not meet. And then I, I used to talk to my professors about this and I'd sit there and I'm like, you can't be a socialist and an anarchist because an anarchist means no rulers. Exactly. Socialism is the domination and elimination of private property 
by a governing entity called well, the state. If you read books on socialism and you read books on communism, and I don't know yeah. where they get this. I was hoping you could illuminate some uh, this a little bit for me. They say the total, what, what is the end of communism? What's the goal of it? And it's set, they say to have no government. And there's nothing I've seen historically supporting that claim. You know, right. everything I see historically about communism and how it has played out has never been the end of no government. It's been a crushing, overbearing government bigger yeah. than the Leviathan we have here. Yeah, it's a very naive notion. And it was really it was the the, the nugget of it was really promoted by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, and uh, his first he, he entered these contests in France and uh, there were these like writing contests because he wanted to be part of the salon figures, you know, the people who would hang out like with Voltaire and stuff. Yeah, those were and, all the posh people back then for the. Yeah, yeah, they Russia. were the posh people. But there were also a lot of the philosophers and mathematicians and scientists and stuff like that. They would, you know, yeah, yeah, back then those guys used to be popular regard, not, uh, not Kim Kardashian yeah. and 50 Cent, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where, where yeah. have we gone? I I'm sorry, I, I had to throw that. No, in. man, yeah, I can see it now. You know, people, people crowd surfing to Descartes. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, man, oh, dude, that was some pretty wild tripping. <laughs> yeah, well, you mean, yeah, Descartes, man, blows your mind. But uh, anyway, yeah. yeah, the scientific method, man. Whoa, <laughs> who's that bacon dude? But anyway, yeah. I smell bacon. bacon. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, but it was interesting because because um, he actually had before he came out with um, with the social contract, he had his uh, discourse on inequality. He had two discourses on inequality, and he sent one of them. It's great. It was all about private property, and and this is where the Marxism thing that end result of Marxism. It's tautological. It's self defeating, and it doesn't work. And in inherent in it is this hatred of private property and this belief that it has to be gotten rid of, that it's somehow artificially imposed by the wealthy. Right. right. So that was Rousseau's thing. So here, get this. And I always I used to play a bit from Repo Man. Uh, have you ever seen Repo Man with the yep. says OK, so there's you know, the scene where um, one of his friends gets shot and he's lying on the floor. He's like, Ugh. Lights are growing dim, Otto. I know a life of crime led me to this sorry fate, but I, I blame society. <laughs> society made me what I am, right? Right. That's Rousseau in a nutshell. Rousseau fathered five illegitimate kids. He sent every one of them off to the foundlings' home. And then he had the gall to complain that he had never experienced the pleasure of a father and child's embrace. Like, dude, wow. you your own kids. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's, and then he blamed his hardship on the fact that there was private property. So, oh, he, so, so he was the beginner of the, the, the disregard for personal responsibility in any oh, way, man. shape or form. I, you know, I yeah, hear that yeah. all the time. It's the government's fault. It's this person's fault. It's society's fault. You know, oh, they should wait, raise the minimum wage. How come people at Taco Bell can't afford a house? Because you're not supposed to be able to afford a house. If you work at Taco Bell, you're supposed to suffer while you work at Taco Bell. So you improve yourself, right. and, you know, and lift yourself up to the next rung in the ladder. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, man. You know, uh, as an aside, when I went to Australia, the uh, the Rotary Club from nearby sent five young people around. You could go sign up. I wasn't in the Rotary or anything, but they were just nice. They, they sent five of us to Australia. And uh, I got to meet a whole bunch of really great people who were business owners and stuff. And one of the guys owned every McDonald's in Queensland, in the in that state of, of Australia. He owned every one. And he had started working at a restaurant. And, you know, like, Bussing tables and washing stuff and everything. And he saved up his money, got some investment, and he was able to start a franchise for McDonald's. And he knew how restaurants worked. So he could manage it really well. Exactly. You know, and but that's he, just the kind of guy that those people hate. Yeah. And look where he right. came from. Right. They and don't this understand is where, where he came from. Yeah. And and one of the one of the things that Rousseau doesn't understand is, you know, and, and I understand coming from coming from the context of the, you know, the feudal system or the royal peerage system or anything like that. I understand how people and this is where Marx went wrong. Marx was correct to be upset about the burghers, the bourgeois, right? The real bourgeois 
were the burgers. That's where the term bourgeois comes from. The burgers okay. were from Germany. They were the ones who were the royal governors that were appointed by the governors, and they got a lot of special privileges. So it was the feudal bloodline give, handing special privileges to people. A lot of the, um, the feudal guilds were started through that sort of favoritism thing, and then they worked back and forth with the government the same way we get rent-seeking in the, in the United States or other Western nations today, where they played on the people who were the big, big guys in politics, and then they got special favors and exclusion of competition. So Marx was able to successfully apply the hatred of the feudal lords towards the end of the feudal era as the Industrial Revolution was coming up, and he was able to take that hatred of the enclosure movement where a lot of the royal blood were, had taken people's land and they had put their own sheep on there now and they had taken away their farming and put in grazing and things like that. And that was forcing people to come to the cities. And But the city, in, as, as Ludwig von Mises pointed out, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, as it, you know, as even though it went con, uh, uh, concomitant with, at the same time with uh, the... Um, with this, you know, push of people away from the countryside, it actually there many lives were saved because the industrial revolution and capitalism were around. Uh, you have the favoritism part of it, but those people would have starved. They were eating right. grass in some cases out in the countryside because they they no longer had their livelihoods. They had been taken by these people who had the 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 feudal bloodlines. So Marx was correct in a way to not like the bourgeoisie. But he started to apply the term bourgeoisie to all sorts of market involved competing people who were just getting involved with business and then to capitalism itself, which is exactly what Rousseau's mistake was. Rousseau believed that the natural state of man was that he had no concerns. He would sleep with anybody he wanted, do anything he wanted, and there was never any conflict. And the problem was that inequality, as he said, was shown by the first person who put his stake in the ground and said, this is mine. OK, so how, one has to ask Rousseau when he was going for those prizes, what if somebody else had claimed his writing for, for their own, right. his or her own? Of course, he recognizes private property. He wanted the money. He wanted the fame. He wanted the accolades. We know this. Right. So he's a massive hypocrite there as well. But that nugget of despising private property is in the end what undercuts socialism and the end the the end result the nadir or the the positive apex marx might say of communism which is supposed to be the elimination of the state well you can't eliminate the state if you need some powerful entity to make sure that private property doesn't right. fall into people's hands distributed everything exactly from, you know, from if one you, central location i just you know what it what it comes down to. It seems like the, the 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 people who have these ideas in their head from from back then. Now, now we just got discuss, done discussing this guy from France that way back in the day. Yeah. Okay. To now, I, yeah. people I know in my life who think like that. Yeah. It sounds, so I'm going to break it down real simple. It, it, you know, it might melt your brain a little bit. They're jealous. Yeah. They're jealous because somebody did something better, worked harder, spent more time trying to do something. Yeah. All right. And, and 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 like to your point, some of the morals, the morals it takes to do that, to build a business, to do things, to and have people want to deal with you, right? You can't be a piece of garbage and walk around and people, are, oh yeah, I want to deal with this guy business wise. Even if you have the best business and product in the world, you treat people like crap. They're not going to go and get your service, right? Exactly. You have kind of morals, right? right. But these right. people are they don't maybe they don't grasp that moral. Uh, aptitude that we have, uh, other people have and but comes down to brass tax man you're jealous yeah they yeah exactly nowadays right you're hating on that person yeah right? it's it's all envy based it's all envy based that's exactly what it is and which is why morals guard yeah are so important and that's why this term christian anarchism christian anarchist volunteerist yeah. is so important let's yeah uh, exactly folks at home okay yeah. Just breaking it down easy. This is this is right from uh, I believe this is the uh, anarchist library. Christian anarchism is a Christian movement in political theology that claims anarchism is inherent to Christianity and the Gospels. It is grounded in the belief there is only one source of authority. This is where Garv has been going the whole time, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. This is the if uh, 
correct me if I'm wrong. This is the essence of Chris, Christian anarchism. It's yep. not total lawless, ladies and gentlemen, like whether you do believe. There is a leader. There's one supreme leader that everybody has to answer to. Anyways, sorry, I got excited, Gart. Yeah, no, really this excited. is great, man. Okay. It is grounded in the belief that there is only one source of authority to which Christians are ultimately answerable, the authority of God as embodied in the teachings of Jesus. It therefore rejects the idea that human governments have ultimate authority over human societies. Christian anarchists denounce the state, believing it is violent, deceitful, and Id idolatrous. Mm -hmm. Christian anarchists hold that the kingdom of God is the proper expression of their relationship between God and humanity. Under the kingdom of God, human relationships would be characterized by horizontal organization, servant leadership, and universal compassion, not through the, the traditional structure of organized religion, which most Christian anarchists consider hierarchical and, an, and or authoritarian structures. Most Christian anarchists are also pacifists who reject war and militarism and the use of violence. More than any other Bible source, the Beatitudes are used as a basis for Christian anarchism. What, yeah. what do you think of what I just read there, Gardner? That's, I mean, that's a really, really good overview. And uh, yeah, you know, it, the, the only authority is God. And when you think about, oh, that's great. Oh, terrific. Have you ever been here? Have you ever seen this book? No. Was that the source of it right there? No, no. The source of this one here, I'll, uh, I believe this was, uh, no, this is just Wikipedia. You, you type in Christian anarchism. This is actually a book written on Christian anarchism. And uh, I did highlight something out of it. But yeah, check it out, man. I'll send you the links. Yeah. Who's the author on that? Alexandre, a Greek guy. Uh, Alexandra, I can't see it because it's getting chopped Oh, back. well, I'll, yeah. I'll really look forward to seeing that. There are a bunch of really good ones. Uh, Michael Meharry of the 10th Amendment Center is a Christian anarchist, and he has a lot of uh, really good material over at his uh, website. If you look up, look up Christian anarchism or and, and Michael Meharry, M-A-H-E-R-R-E-Y, I think it is. Um, and you can find the link over most likely at the 10th Amendment Center as well. Um, but he's terrific. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, and, and you know, it's interesting. Tiger, so, so, because... so hold on real quick. Here's the, okay. What? The, oh yeah. The Beatitudes. Not, yeah. Yeah. People might not know what those are. Those are the gospels. Yeah. Okay. So let me tell you people, when, when people say what, well, you know, what do Christian anarchists follow? They follow these gospels, the Beatitudes, right. you know, that right. that's, that's what, that's, that's their rule. That right. is their moral compass. That is what's telling them where to go, what to, you know, and how to go there and, and how to do it, you know? Yeah. So I, I just, it irritates me when people look at a Christian anarchist or anarchism and say, oh, you can't be Christian and be an anarchist. Because I've heard that a million times. And it's it's a, a ludicrous statement. Well, yeah. And, you know, the other thing too, Tiger, is uh, people will say, well, you know, in the Bible, it says that you are supposed to be subservient to your ruler. You know, uh, that you're, you, you know, you have to, you have to answer to the ruler. And it's like, well... It depends on what uh, is considered to be a valid and justified ruler. Who's Guard Goldsmith's ruler? Yeah, you know. Let me, no, Ant, can you tell me? Tell tell us who rules Guard Goldsmith? Exactly. It, it has to be. There's only one ruler over all men, and that's the Lord. That's the Creator. And so, Thank you. yeah. And so, if you've got a human being claiming authority over someone that immediately see people will say well you see justified government is the the government that's limited only to upholding what is in the in the bible it's like well then that means you can't have the state you can't because nope. the state steals from people and that's that's against the 10 commandments you have to have a voluntary system, otherwise you're breaching God's commandments. So when they say, well, a limited government that upholds the Ten Commandments, well, the government by its nature doesn't uphold the Ten Commandments at the outset. It's a non-starter. You can't have it. It's, it's, it's illogical. There's no way somebody constructs an argument that says that the state somehow is God's will. Because the state replaces God's will. The state interferes with God's will. 
the yeah. state tells you you must give it some stuff. And the state is just a bunch of people. That's all it is. And but it's just not by, God's will it, anymore. It's the people's yeah, will. It's the yeah. people who are in the state. Yeah, and it can't say, well, we promised you protection, so now we're going to go take your stuff. Again, they haven't given you a choice. No. And then if they do give you a choice, then it's not the polis. It's a business deal. You're hiring a special security force, and it's not the state. You see, it exactly. just people just keep going around and around. It, it, it's either society free or state not free. Society, make your own choices, your own free will, get your own protection. State claims it's giving you protection, but it can't because it has to threaten you to do it. And that breaches God's will. It's right. you're done. You know, I mean, it's like it's so simple. And the other thing that gets me is, you know, we were talking about we the people. And I mentioned on my show uh, the other night, there's only I the person yes. to, to have the arrogance to say that I as an individual and now saying I am we the people. Is it, that's 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 devilish as well. We are legion. No, I am individual. I was created individual. I was created to leave the other individuals alone. Right. I mean, what else can you say? And then you get into uh, Immanuel Kant's philosophy, which is universalizability. If, for example, you have a system where I can't be sovereign on my own, then nobody can be sovereign. And then everything breaks down. If you have a system where thievery is okay, then everybody can engage in thievery and you don't even have a concept of private property and nobody's going to do anything. If you have a system where lying is okay, this is Immanuel Kant's, you know, religious free concept of things. It's not universalizable. So in all these instances, and, and to get back to the rights idea, when you talked about morality, the term rights comes from Middle English and uh, ancient German, and it stands for right handedness. And the reason it goes for right handed right handedness was because that was understood that if you were right handed, that was proper. Yeah. Left handed people. Sorry, you know, lefties, they were seen as abnormal. My mom used to get her hand hit by the nuns in school because she was left-handed until she learned how to write with her right hand. Interesting. Interesting. So what does she do now? Does she do it lefty or righty or is she? She doesn't do anything now, but she, she, she went back to her left hand. She's, yeah. she's, in, she's in heaven with the Lord. But oh. yeah. So, yeah, but no, and guard, this is the thing, you, you know, to make what you're saying to wrap it up in a pretty bow tie. Mm. Dude, this, it really, I, I was thinking of this today when I was walking the dog, thinking about our show and this is the thing that I really gather from this, that universalism that you were talking about without without any moral construct, that doesn't work. It's right, not going to exactly. work. Right, that is right. the anarchy that everybody thinks about. And yeah. here's my thing, and you can see it today. Whether you have a government or not, the moral compass, the morals of the people in the society that you're in are going to dictate law. So if you if you think about it, if you're in a, a community and you don't have a, a leader, a government, and there's a rapist, okay, everyone in that community, if they're morals and they have morals, and they're Christians or they're in a religion that has morals, right? They're going to say they're not, that's not acceptable. And when the, a person does something like that, there's going to be consequences by either an individual or a group of individuals are going to get together, like in the West, and, and you're going to have consequences, right? So it's understood that you don't do that. Right. 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 So, so, you know, and that's you don't need the government for that. People will handle that. The contracts, all that. Fast forward to today. OK, you, would you ever think that we, they would pass a law or that we would need to have to pass a law in our society that children can't mutilate themselves, you know, and have a transgender sex change uh, surgery or that we'd have we'd be murdering babies and, and murdering babies at nine months old? I mean, it's bad enough just murdering a baby, but up to nine months old. Yeah, that shows you the moral compass. It's the yeah. morals. It doesn't with the government, without the government, with people have bad morals. Those things are going to happen. Right. And I, I think that with the government, it has been shown that it makes it worse. Exactly. Um, it's yeah. an agitator yeah. of this of this effect. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've already got the Pandora's box open that people's private property is not respected. So from there, all else follows, whether it's not respected because we want to build this great canal in Alexander Hamilton's uh, great tradition. And we don't know what that money, money might have been used for if it had been left in the hands of the people who actually earned it. Uh, what they wanted to do for their kids or their progeny, uh, their neighbors, their loved ones, an old person in their lives, whatever it might be. Or if, you know, it doesn't even have to be something that I might think is a laudable thing. Maybe they just wanted to stack it up in their kitchen. It's, right. it's fine, you know. Um, so that sort of moral moral digression is at the heart of the state and then everything else follows. So you have Jean-Jacques Rousseau, what he didn't realize was he said that men come out of the state of nature, just like John Locke, he said that men come out of the state of nature and they form a government. And he thought that what was important was to make sure that there was no private property that could be upheld by the government, which is not gonna work. You've got now a machinery of total predation, right? But that is the nature of the state. And it's going to it's going to get to that point in so many areas because people are going to try to take advantage of it over and over again. So whether it opens right at the gate, as happened in the French Revolution, and people are just I'll take whatever I want or you get some speed bumps along the way where you have a philosophy that does embrace a concept of natural rights, but breaks it down right at the start to say that your natural rights are protected by breaking your natural rights and having a government, right. uh, which is what the founders did. Um, you know, they went by John Locke's mistake, saying that there was somehow this magical social contract that I never signed that they're going to impose on me and somehow I should be happy about it. And that, it's, and that by doing so, they're protecting my rights. It's like, excuse me, what if I don't want your protection? Oh, I think we understand the reality of it now that tears the artifice of it you're not protecting anybody's friggin' rights are you no. no of course you're not you're imposing your ideas of how the policing action should be done and you know i i went into some examples i have the book next to me still from doing my show some examples from this book uh private governance uh, by ed stringham who used to head up the uh, american institute for economic research over in great barrington massachusetts where the great barrington declaration was signed uh two years ago now two and a half um, and what's interesting there is he goes through all these great examples and there are other books that do this as well. Uh, all these great examples of people voluntarily joining with each other and coming up with their own governance systems that were better because they were more addressable. But I, I, I think what's interesting when I talk to you, Tiger, is, you know, when we think about the, the religious aspect of this, I say to myself, OK, if people want to argue biblically that the polis is acceptable even though i would just prefer to be left alone what will they do to impose the polis on me hmm. just take a look at history exactly how far are they willing to go or will they leave me alone and say oh you know what yeah I recognize the Ten Commandments. I can't engage in these activities to coerce you and force you to do my bidding. I think it's pretty simple, you know. And and uh, interestingly enough, when you look through history and you look at the efficiency and the addressability of anarchist systems that have been around for a while, one of the things that that Jason Barker and I discussed on the show is, you know, I understand a lot of people come up with questions on a practical side. They'll look at the morals. They'll say, yeah, you know, I understand your argument is, is pretty strong there. Morally, it's unacceptable. But then they switch off. It's like this on off switch. They can't help it. And they'll say, but what about the roads? Right? What about the schools? Yeah, what about, right, what right. Function? What about, what about yeah, you know? yeah. And some people, I think, I, I think the strongest arguments are made by people who talk about defense. Right. They'll say, but wouldn't wouldn't an anarchist system that they think inherently is peaceful and doesn't use coercion and is nonviolent be prone to attacks well being non-aggressive does not mean that you aren't ready for violence and as i mentioned to jason i think anybody who understands you know what life can bring 
who recognizes, hey, I might want to get a gun for self-defense or I might want to put a lock on my doors or I might want to protect against a storm and have new shingles or whatever. You're forward thinking. You think about risks, right? And so uh, what you end up doing is you start to recognize that other people are thinking about risks as well. And so insurance companies come about. And that is where insurance companies incentivize people to make sure that they ameliorate their own risks. Right. So if we know that insurance is a market driven, not government created thing, and that insurance is self-sustaining without the government, people get insurance, then we have to figure that people, even in an anarchist situation where they don't have a tax funded government, government will have governance, will have rules for their people that voluntarily join their groups. Just like when you play basketball, if you get a guy who's fouling everybody and tripping people up, he's out. Yeah. You're not playing with that guy and word's going to get around. Don't, don't, don't mess with that guy. He's, he's a grave digger. Get rid of him. You know? Well, yeah. So, yeah. It, it, things naturally will happen. Jerry will build a road to get his pencils over to the pencil supplier. The pencil supplier might help Jerry build that road because he needs Jerry's pencils, right? And right. so on and so forth. It's it's natural. Yeah. It's, there's no force. Everybody agrees to do one thing because it maybe it's beneficial mutually, you know, mutually yeah. beneficial. Yeah. That, that's what people don't get. And I think the defense thing guard, to your point, would work the same way. I think some people would be intelligent enough to say, hey, we got all these countries. They want to come over here all the time. You know, let's let's do something. Let's make right. sure that we have a plan. And right. that's not collectivism. That's a bunch of individuals getting together and deciding and all agreeing on something and working towards it together. Volunteer, yeah, and, volunteer yeah. Basis. yeah. And, you know, Tiger, I'll, 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 I'll complete a thought uh, there. Hand it back to you, you know, anytime. And then I got another thing that sort of is a secondary uh, question for people considering anarchism and, and where it might logically go. Gar, um, I'm sorry if I jumped on you or, or ran over your tongue. Oh, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's, no. It's, it's an extremely this, exciting conversation. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. And I know that things fly real fast, too. So so and it, and that's that's totally great. I, I think it's great. So so one of the things is uh, people say, yeah, well, you know, defense, would they be prepared? Would they do this? And you say, well, look, as I mentioned to Jason, you know, if we think that government supposedly represents the people, then that already shows us that people are thinking about defense. Because that's mainly the main thing that they wrote into things like the Constitution, provide for the common defense, right? Right. So if that's already in there, and we already know that under the Articles of Confederation, the states as entities weren't putting up their money to do things the, to do things that they, 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 they wanted them to do, like Hamilton and so forth, and they use this common defense thing as an argument. Well, uh, they were able to beat Britain without the Constitution. So clearly the common defense for those people was provided without that central constitution based government. But I'll leave that hanging. People say if you've got anarchy and these people are peacefully minded, they're not going to engage in their own defense. Well, they'll say, look, the Irish lost to the English. The Irish were in an anarchist Brehan law system. I was like, yeah, how long? Over a thousand years. Exactly. I was like, that's a pretty good run, right? I mean, well, there's a lot of stuff like the Roman Empire. People don't understand how a lot of that worked and how it was so big. It was anarchy, basically, it, it, in a lot of regions. It was exactly. the way that that worked. People don't understand that. Yeah, they, they let a lot of those local areas go and they let them have their culture. And you can see writings of, of various czars, Caesars, who were like, yeah, you got to keep it yeah. local. And in fact, they would if they sent out centurions, they would try to get the centurions to try to work into marry into the local culture and things like that. So that in fact, there's a really good uh, there's a really good book, series of books, actually, by a Canadian named Jack White, uh, W.H.Y.T.E. Uh, the first one is called Sky Stone. And um, it's basically it picks up as the Roman legions are leaving, but a few of the guys stay behind. And it's basically about the the how they become King Arthur and the first knights of the realm. Nice. And it's a yeah, it's pretty cool. So but um, yeah, so so that that Brehan law uh, example is a great example of, hey, you know, they resisted a lot of attacks and they were not centrally governed. They were, you know, tribes that got along with each other. Then you've got the Vikings. The Vikings lasted for about a thousand years. 
and they did it as well. Now, on the second level, now people can say, yeah, but in the end, they were taken over. I'm like, all right, okay. In the end, all, all civilizations fall or get taken yeah. over or crumble. Yeah, you know, I mean, what can you do, you know? So, I mean, the Roman Empire certainly well, crumbled. The founders, even the founders, okay, or the founding of this country, the Civil War, or, the, you know, with, with Britain, the Revolutionary War, guys. Right. That was a, they, what they weren't highly organized. It took three days, you know, to get messages out to people. It was ragtag groups of people, and they, they went. The yeah. farmers went, the people right. said, oh, and it wasn't a huge part of the population either. Just enough went because they seen, you know, they might not, I'm in trouble here. My farm's in trouble. Everything's in trouble. If I don't go help these guys, yeah. up, these invaders, it's, you know, plain to see. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing too, that I should mention as an aside, cause I can imagine one or two people who are in the audience thinking about this, cause my students would do this sometimes too. And we'd have conversations of it. If you start to argue yeah, but what about the national defense? What about the defense? Couldn't they be taken over? That, again, is a consequentialist analysis. It's not a moral analysis. No. It's still looking at, yeah, but what about the practicalities of not telling people how to live? Well, how about we just stop at not telling people how to live see, and you don't have to think about the rest of it. But right. if you do, see, that's the problem. You, you, people constantly fall back into that into that mode of thinking because they sensibly worry about, well, wouldn't this happen or wouldn't that happen? One of the areas that I do think where, where practicalities could meet up with this moral problem, but again, the answer is not the immoral imposition of the state because that just makes it worse is the question is, let's say, you know, we're talking about roads and you, you put it perfectly, Tiger. I always talk about like, hey, um, if I'm too stupid to, for my own benefit, sign on to having a road made if I've got a business, then how am I smart enough to have a parking lot for my business or the driveway right. or have doors to get in? Like, duh. I'm going to figure out ways to allow people to get access to me. And if I'm a homeowner and I'm too stupid to be able to contribute some money to get a road built down to my house, then how am I smart enough to make my own driveway and steps to go to my front door? Exactly. It's exactly. insane. The, the, the person who doesn't think about those things through the division of labor will find something else for him to do. Yeah. Right. And he'll be right. a sur he'll survive somehow. Yeah, maybe yeah, not, yeah. You know, maybe he's not the, the people that think that way. Maybe they're not the people, you know, that that are able to handle this kind of society or understand it. You know. Yeah, but, yeah. And and you know, Tiger, there there are a couple other things too that really uh, focus one's attention on the smaller spheres of control concept as well. Uh, you know, before I read F. A. Hayek stuff. Excuse me. Before I read Hayek stuff, Hayek. yeah, um, my dad. Maybe it came through osmosis, but I had already gotten to a point where I said, "Yeah, the larger the sphere of control, the less connected it is to the local problems on hand. People aren't there. They have no moral connection to people. They have an information problem, and their decisions, if they're bad, will harm more people. And the harder it is to escape that large geographical area." So, I, you know, by the time I was like 14 or 15, I'd be in school and I'd be looking at my teachers like, well, this is dumb, you know, and it might have come from my dad reading some of Hayek's work and then talking to me. But it was always just sort of the way that I I thought of things. You know, I think a lot of people just innately are like, yeah, small is more addressable to the problems. Right. And and then you have then you have this eternal logical question, which is, well, if 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 I'm too stupid, if 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 a small group of people are are incapable of handling their own situations voluntarily, then am I incapable of handling my own situations internally? And if I'm incapable of handling my own life internally, how am, how is it possible that I can then vote as a fallible person to send another fallible person into an office to then not only do what they supposedly promised me to do, but myriad other things right. that and we I'm haven't even decisions considered. decisions for other fallible people when I go to vote. Yeah. Am yeah. I not? Am yeah. I not trying to force my decision on other people? Yeah, exactly. Or, yeah, that's an, that's another, the whole voting thing is a whole, con that's another two hour. Oh, 100%. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, get you it, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from with that. Yeah, man. Hey, I wanted and, and, to uh, hmm. shout out everybody on Twitter. I wasn't trying, ignoring you. I was just trying to get into the Twitter so I could, I could. Get oh, some yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Here. We got, uh, 
Chris Graves with Digging Chris Graves, the mastodon of researchers. Oh, he yeah. Says, uh, Love Gar- those Jack the Ripper shows he did the other day. Those were awesome. Bad ass. I'm going to yeah, say. Man. Yeah, they were badass. Um, he has a question for you. Mm-hmm. Does Guard think we can reclaim this country from the reptoids from the planet <laughs> Pop Tart? <laughs> it's, it's a terrible question. I, I didn't read it before I read it. I just read it. Oh man, that's classic. Like, messing around. That's a good one, Chris. Yeah, you know, go Guard, it, go AT, rescue oh, thanks, dog. Man. Yeah, rescue I can't wait to get the- to all furry creatures. And what a wonderful lady she is. She retweets all our stuff, Guard. When I when is I that rescue rescue out, dog. Yep. Yeah. She is the bomb. Yeah, yeah, I never yeah. heard that interpretation of Robin Hood. She says, "Guard, she loves it." Oh yeah, hundred percent. In fact, a uh, rescue dog. If you go down to Texas back in the uh, mid '90s, and they did this in New Hampshire, um, they had a, a systematic attempt to try to centralize education, uh, education decision making, and pedagogy, uh, and take it out of localities. You know, to make it even worse than it already is in the government-run school system, to centralize it even more in the state houses and the federal government. So um, there was a document. I downloaded it on my old computer. There was a website that actually gave people advice on how to do this to sue because there was the claim that there was a right to education and then it was codified in all these different state constitutions, which is absurd because there is no right to the fruits of anybody else's labor. And as I mentioned, if people think that because a child can't teach himself, there is somehow a legal statutory so-called supported right to the parent of that child taking somebody else's labor to educate the child, we have a major problem. And you yeah, can and force, yeah. that, force that parent to put their child in an institutional school. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that- yeah. And, 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 and it, you can, you can extrapolate from that to say, okay, if there is a right to the fruits of, of that taxpayer's labor to pay for the education system, why don't we just rip the artifice off it and enslave all the teachers and make them work instead of yeah. the taxpayer to work? We would never do that. It would never be accepted. Right? right. And you know that the job that they would do would be absolute. Oh, it is absolute crap. Sorry. Well, yeah. You know what? Yeah. I think in the division of labor, those teachers wouldn't be teachers. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. In, Without in some sort of division of labor. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and, we, and on... had, we had JB from uh, Knights. Of the, I think he's watching from the Knights of the Storm. Economy. All right. He, he's the guy. Big JB in the house. Woof, 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 woof. My man. Hey, everybody on Twitter. This is for you. You guys are roaring for liberty. Out there. We love it. We love it. And I like that. When you... And the, like the episode's that. getting a little long in a tooth guard. Final thoughts, brother. Give oh, us man. I thoughts. didn't even realize. Oh, I was just going to mention on Chris's question, whether it was, uh, you know, rhetorical or not. Uh, I think we all no, that's too assumptive. Um, I think many of us recognize that the system under under which we have been uh, suffering for so long. And I do mean suffering, you know, uh, in so many different ways, in so many different fields and so many different aspects of people's lives, uh, whether it's educational, professional, personal, whatever, uh, medical uh, privacy. Um, I think that uh, clearly this large hegemonic United States, so-called as one entity, is problematic to a massive degree. Um, but I don't see how the unraveling is going to take place. And I don't, and this, this oftentimes this leads to sort of like negative or melancholic um, thoughts. You know what I mean, Tiger? It's sort of like, yeah, you know, I don't know. It's going to break up. Things are going to get really rough. Things we got to find people we got to be, you know, hanging out with. It's very, it's very apocalyptic, you know, but I think realistically speaking, the system, the system is unsupportable. And if you do look at the uh, idea of nullification, 10th Amendment Center is great on that. You know, uh, Michael Bolden, every almost every day, Michael Bolden is, is putting out something awesome from the 10th Amendment Center, separating, nullifying. Uh, Tom Woods has a great book on nullification. There's a, a number of other ones that are out there. I just got one from the Mises Institute. Unfortunately, the Amazon guys, when I ordered it, I should have just given Mises a donation because you can download it free from them. And I didn't realize it. And they left it out in the rain and it got destroyed, ah. you know, but ah, that's um, horrible. Yeah, it was sort of like that song, uh, MacArthur's Park. They left that cake out in the rain. I'll never have this recipe again. I don't know what the right. heck that means. But anyway, um, maybe it just means add water. It's instant cake mix. And, you know, I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, I think I think to answer that question just real quick, uh, I don't know how it would go, but um, I think decentralization is the way to go. And I also wish that there were a, a place where we could escape. You know, you look at the guys going to Anarchapulco. I've wanted to go. I've been invited down by, by friends many times. And I've just been so sick. I can't go. 
And uh, so this year is the same thing. I just was like, well, I might be feeling better, but I can't do it. But I think there are going to be ways, even when we're stuck right now with this system, to go gray market, uh, maybe black market, and try to help each other that way, and then find areas where we can congregate. I, I think they would try to hunt us down, uh, but you know, may, maybe there's that. And uh, and then just just recognize that the the final escape comes from God. You right. Know? Yeah. No, you know, uh, my final thoughts real quick. I just, I wanted everybody to get to know uh, where you were coming from. I, you know, you're a really smart guy and your, your, your perspective is so dynamic on things. You, you look at things from many different angles and you kind of, you're very succinct in being able to wrap them together and, and tie things together, connect the dots through history, through philosophy, all of that. And I just wanted people to know, you know, I got what you were saying right away because of my libertarian way of thinking of, the, the state is force, right? And force is, you know, that's you, the golden rule and all that kind of stuff. You don't use force. You don't use force to take things from people, taxation and stuff and all that. And then we add into the moral side of the Christian anarchism, where it comes from, the real rules of Christian anarchism, with it, which if you ask me, there is a ruler. It's God. Your morals rule you. This is something that is not impractical or you can't do it. It's just a fantasy utopia. No. It, the, if you have a society who has the morals, then you're going to be able to do it. As the morals decay, that you could I, I, right now, I'll be honest with you, I don't think we could do it. We don't have the morals. Yeah. The people here in this country are sick. The morals yeah. are sick, but it's not. It's not a destroy everything lawless. Oh, we just want to be able to do what they. No, a Christian anarchist has morals. His ruler is God, not the president, not a constitution, not not a body of Congress, not some regulatory office. It is God. And and you know what? That is to me, I'm a purist kind of, of certain things. That's the natural law. So you're saying that the law of anarchy and the Christian anarchist is the natural law. That's my opinion. And that's my perspective of it. And that's yeah. the thing, brother. How can you not, you know, that's, you know, it's the opposite of what everybody thinks it is. Oh hey! Oh hey! Hey, hey. tell them good the bald people guy. Where they can find you. I think still. Where are we at the MRC TV? Uh? Yeah, MRC TV. Oh, I should just mention also, just to leave this hanging, uh, yes, Tiger. Um, the question of devolution of uh, market systems into, let's say, the roads. We'll say, okay, in the United States, roads started. They were mostly built privately, and so on. And then finally, as the building companies were very good at it. They realized that they could take advantage of the small governments that were there and start getting contracts. And instead of buying the land outright, they could, would get the government to take it through eminent domain, and then they would get the contracts to build the roads. And the same thing with various business interests. Well, I'll have a road steered towards the property that I have, and then I'll put a bunch of business, I'll rent out a bunch of businesses. So there is this question as to how corruptive the market systems could be but at the heart of it is always the presence of the government to start granting people those legal statutory privileges exactly so, i think in, in in the society that you and i are talking about the christian anarchist society that person would right away people would recognize what he was and he would wither away right? yeah yeah because then uh, people yeah. wouldn't do business with him after a while hey i seen you ruin that guy i seen you ruin this lady i seen you ruin that business right yeah yeah, and I'll, I'll leave I'll leave the question open because I think it's it's really fruitful for more conversation and exploration. And then I love looking talking into, to you, man. I'm sorry. Go on. Yeah. No. 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 I, I just I just leave the question open, and then to be able to look into other um, other historical examples like the Brihan Law system, and uh, people can look up some of the Brihan Law stuff on YouTube. It's Brihan Brihan Law Academy, I think it is. Uh, the, the guy's name, if you want to look it up, is Kevin Flanagan. Uh, he did a Mises lecture once. It's phenomenal. He's great. Brehan Law is B-R-E-H-O-N, Brehan Law. And uh, you can check out all the videos. He has historical stuff about the Irish and stuff like that. It's very, very cool. Nice. Uh, but yeah, yeah. And thanks so much, Tiger. There's so many really interesting things to talk about. And, you know, you throw something out over there and then you pull it back and you get this thing over here. And just talking to you, I was thinking as as we were starting about the background image that you have for the tiger's den and that sunlight that's up there near the yellow at the top it's such a beautiful picture and i thought to myself you know that sun shines down on all of us and it should send us a message 
all yeah. the stuff around us should send us a message. And that message to me is to leave my neighbor alone in peace. And, and, and because I, I don't want to be directing my neighbor's life. And I think there is something innate in me that has told me that. And that came from God. And yeah, if people want to find my stuff, mrctv.org. Uh, MRC yeah, you got TV, it. Yep. Yep, yep. That's a good spot. Um, and then, um, oh, we got dude. Wow. over here, guys. Liberty Conspiracy. You are not a number. You are oh, free man. You're so prepared, man. That's so, yeah, I'm not a number. Uh, I was a little frustrated by tonight's show because there was one, there were two things I wanted to call up and I couldn't do it. And I was frustrated, but um, just, dude, there's so much stuff when we're doing this, right? You, you get, you know, there's so much I, I skipped over while we were talking. I skipped stuff, you know, because we're having a great conversation. There's yeah. only so much time, you know, that's kind of why Jay and I started this, that, and you know, where I got our sub stack, maybe we can pull a little bit and that helps us with the show. You know, one thing I wanted to mention, um, we'll get into that in a second. We'll go, we'll, I'll mention that in a second, but yeah, everybody, Check out his Liberty Conspiracy. It, this is an awesome show, you know, and, and it's dynamic. He does a lot of different things, go over a lot of different subjects, you know, and y your brain's going to blow up after you're done watching it. Usually I got I to gotta turn my head on the side and let some of that information out into this bag that I put guards information in. It says guard on it, right? <laughs> that, that's what I have to do after I'm done watching Liberty Conspiracy. You can also find guard on Twitter, ladies and gentlemen, and um, he's got a sub stack. And then you go to his sub stack and this is my favorite, uh, right? I, I, um, you get his writing, you get his musings, you get all the information he digs up for everybody. And, and that, you know, you can't beat it. You can't yeah. beat it. Am I missing anything guard? Uh, I don't think so, dude. Oh, the fiction stuff. Uh, oh, people oh, on, yeah. They can look for that stuff. And, yeah, uh, the novellas yeah. he writes and the fiction, all that. I mean, this guy is just, dude, you're so much fun to talk to. And just your, your, your views, your viewpoints and everything are insane. I, I, you know, they, they just not insane. They, they're, there's so much, bro. <laughs> you know, so much. It's like, when I think of, well, who can I get to talk to me about this? Well, Gar Goldsmith, you, you're the first one, one of the first ones that pop in my head. It's like you and Don Jeffries or, and Vince and all you guys. It's like, my own to meet you guys and talk to you guys is, is such an uh, honor and a privilege to me that uh, you would actually share this information and have a conversation with the angry tiger. You know, I'm a body man and a mechanic. You know, I know some stuff, but. You oh, guys man, are, dude. You guys no, real I was going to say. Man. No, the, the, it's so mutual, dude. Like, you have no idea. You and Jason, and you guys are just, every time I watch you guys, like, I even asked you, I think we were, I don't know if we were on the air or off the air. I was like, what was that thing you mentioned? I got to write this down. Like, it's, you do phenomenal work, man. And Thanks, it wow. is just, yeah, it's yeah. awesome. I'm in a comfortable place meeting you guys. And it all comes from, you know, filling in for David and, and asking David to, uh, do these little segments for MRC TV and listening to David before he left Infowars and then sticking with him and the family, meeting David down in Kingston at Gerald Salente's thing, and then continuing the show and just the family of, of you guys. It's just exactly. Uh, yeah, it's great, man. Exactly. Thank you so, much. so everybody, another thing, you want to go to davidknight.gold. I didn't pull it up, and I don't think I'm going to be able to do it before the end of the show here, but we plug David all the time. You go to davidknight.gold. You go and you see Tony Arterburn. If you read my sub stack uh, that I just put out, it's it's about the beware of the head of the snake. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to prepare financially. If you go to davidknight.gold, you can join the Wolf Pack. That'll take you to Art Tony Arterburn, the wisest wolf when it comes to your precious metals. The cheapest pricing online. You get part of a buying group. You're part of a buying group with Wolf Pack. You can buy silver, you know, gold, but you can start from $50 all the way up to 1000 and you get it sent to you monthly. Set it, forget it, and prepare for the onslaught that's coming with the CBDC exactly. and this inflation. Cause they're just, they're turning the inflation up on purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, they're squeezing the life out of us until we beg for the CBDC and that CBDC we're being constricted by the snake. will end up in the belly of the snake. Once we accept the CBDC and there will be no way out. Yeah. You know, man, uh, I've, uh, when I looked at some of the information today with the fed raising by a uh, quarter 20, 25 basis points, and uh, I wrote a piece for MRC TV about uh, how bad the economy is right now, how many more people are on food stamps. It's doubled in three years. I mean, just unbelievable. Not the number, but the sheer expenditures of it, which is a combination of higher prices and more people. Yeah. Um, you know, these sorts of things are concrete, very, very recognizable signals. And I actually I really wonder 
Um, I know that there are going to be various political forces that are going to be pushing to not have this happen because they want to get reelected. But I think the forces that are above them um, are very intent on getting as many people unemployed as possible uh, because they want to have the government impose the CBDC as a way to give them their welfarest, uh, welfarest uh, uh, livelihood as yep. they experience all these troubles. Uh, and I think they also want to connect businesses to these things and incentivize them. If they switch over to CBDC, then they'll be able to use the money with an even greater impact than if they use just regular cash. There's so many ways that they can manipulate this. So we've got to act. We've got to understand these things. And I think this fuel from uh, philosophy and religion is a really wonderful way to feel comfortable and and learn, you know, about some good guys from the past, you know, um, oh, exactly. and God, you know, exactly. Yeah. You have to. Um and, you know, one more thing, ladies and gentlemen, it's it's usually dark, but, you know, real quick, I have some funny stuff for us to watch before we go, but I am Angry Tiger, and this is the Tiger's Den. Follow me on Twitter, at, you know, at Angry Tiger Fireworks. You, you look that up, you'll find me. You know, there's a link tree. It'll it'll send you to this link tree I'm at right now. I'm on, I got, you got me on Spreaker. I really want you guys to go. The main thing, I'm on D Live and I'm on, I'm on uh, Odyssey. But where I really want you guys to go, and Spotify, I'd rather have you guys go to the Substack and to the Rumble. And listen, I'm live streaming through, uh, I tried to live stream through Knights of the Storms Rumble. I need 25 subscribers on my Rumble channel. So the Angry Tigers Den, ladies and gentlemen, you know, go over there and do me a favor and subscribe, please, so we can get up on Rumble Live. But yeah, there and, and, and the Substack, I really, I really think that's the place for people to go because... The, the Substack is really a free a free platform. Yeah, that's, it's great. That's my you, favorite. Yeah, once they start allowing uh, live streaming there, it's going to be awesome. If they, you know if they can allow for like a payment thing, I'm glad Rumble is like that. And I didn't know that about the 25. I'm going to start recruiting, getting people over there. I don't even know what I'm at. It's not that many. Yeah, um, we'll, yeah, so. we'll get you. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that, guard. Yeah, and ladies and gentlemen, you know, again, we 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 talked about a lot of serious stuff, and we'll always talk about serious stuff on the Tigers Den here. Sometimes, I mean, we get a little goofy, but at the end of it, I like to unwind. Um, I don't know if any of you know who Dudley Dickerson is, okay? But you're gonna find out right now. I thought I think this is funny. I have a weird sense of humor, though, so I hope you guys like it. <laughs> I know. I hope you guys could hear that. That was great. That was awesome. Gar, oh, thank man. you so much for coming on, brother. Uh, Big roar of liberty for guard. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, remember, time is your most valuable commodity. Please spend it doing something you love with someone you love or improving yourself or preferably all three of those things. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank guard Goldsmith one more time. Dude, this was awesome, dude. Thank you very much, man. Hey, you know what? Next time I got to get you on the show. We'll talk some more about the stuff and we'll crack open some books. Maybe we'll do a series every once in a while. We'll give it, you know, it's, it's tough because there are always new stories coming along. So I always feel like, oh, I got to get, you know, this information, this new story. So to split it and get into the philosophical stuff, to devote that time to it is hard. But there's something great about it. And I'm actually going to start splitting some segments off of my live show if I think that those are good parts that to help create these lesson plans that's that I'll great. be able to put together later. So That'll, thanks so much, man. I, I, I wish I mean, it's like I wish you were down the street, you know, I know I'd like bring you bring you some grape juice, orange juice, and we'd have some cookies tonight, man. It'd be great. Yeah. We get some cannolis rolling too, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. All right, brother. We'll talk to you soon. And everyone, until we meet again, and thank you for tuning in. Your time is your most valuable commodity. Cherish it and use it wisely until we meet again. Oh.
Wow.